Greetings from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a death in my family uh, that has kept me here uh, at home. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to speak uh, to this year's GRDC Symposium. Uh, and my topic today is uh, somatic alterations in human cancer genomes. Um, before I begin, I'd first like to give an outline of the presentation. Uh, first, there's going to be a general introduction. Uh, then a discussion on mutation of EGFR in lung cancers and comparison to EGFR mutations in glioblastoma. Uh, section 3 uh, will be regarding the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, studies of lung cancer. Uh, and Section 4 uh, will be about the therapeutic and diagnostic implications uh, for human lung cancers. Uh, before I go further, I'd like to make some disclosures. I'm a founding advisor for, a consultant for, an equity uh, holder in foundation medicine. I'm an inventor on the patent for the use of EGFR mutations uh, for the diagnosis of lung cancer. Uh, I get research support from Bayer. Uh, and in one case, I will discuss off-label or investigational use uh, of uh, an approved uh, anti-cancer drug. First, an introduction uh, to lung cancer in general uh, and uh, to uh, some of its, its genomic features, which I'll also describe further later. Uh, first, the public health burden of lung cancer. Uh, I think, uh, as all of you know, cancer is either the leading cause of death or the second leading cause of death following heart disease in the major countries of the developed world. Uh, and uh, within cancers, lung cancer is the most common can cause of cancer death in the United States and worldwide, leading to under over 150,000 cancer deaths per year in the United States, over 1 million cancer deaths per year worldwide. Uh, and well over 15,000 deaths per year in Korea. And this is just a graph showing that uh, from the American Cancer Society uh, that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death both in men uh, and in women uh, in the United States. Most cases of lung cancer are, are associated with smoking, uh, but many are not. If we look at the subtypes of lung cancer, uh, there are three major subtypes, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and small cell lung carcinoma. And uh, this small cell slide is a little bit bigger magnification. These are actually smaller cells. Um, lung squamous cell carcinomas and small cell carcinomas of the lung occur almost exclusively in smokers. Lung adenocarcinoma occurs mostly in smokers, uh, but also occurs in non-smokers. And the five-year survival rate is on the order of 18% uh, for non-small cell lung cancer and on the order of 6% for small cell lung cancer as of the 2003 to 2009 period, uh, it's probably improved somewhat for non-small cell lung cancer since then, but we have a long, long way to go uh, to improve the treatment of lung cancer. The focus of my laboratory is on the somatic cell genomics of cancer. Uh, and so we ask, why study the somatic cell genomics? Uh, first of all, most cancer-causing mutations are somatic. That is to say, they're present in the cancer DNA, but not in the germline DNA. Second, somatic mutations are all internally controlled. We can compare germline and cancer mutations, and these define the cancer-specific alterations and allow for accurate discovery. And third, we've been able to take advantage of the ongoing revolution in human genome analysis, where technology advances in human genomics have the power to transform cancer research and treatment. And you'll see some of that from my presentation. I'd like to begin by discussion of EGFR mutations uh, in lung cancer, one of the most important targetable mutations in this cancer. Our work in this field goes back to 2001 uh, when my colleague Bill Sellers and I uh, began the systematic sequencing of protein kinase genes. And we began with lung cancers, uh, an interest of my lab, prostate cancers, an interest of the Sellers lab, and glioblastomas, an interest of our colleague Charles Sawyers. The first gene that we picked was BRAF as a candidate gene, uh, which was mutated initially in our first screen in about 2% of lung adenocarcinomas, work of Katsuhiko Naoki and colleagues, published in Cancer Research in 2002. We then broadened our focus uh, to study receptor tyrosine kinase genes, uh, because these were the most common known oncogenes, uh, and we thought that we might have the greatest clinical impact uh, by beginning with these genes. And at that time, we sequenced two exons encoding parts of the kinase domain of each gene, the nucleotide binding loop and the activation uh, domain. 
And this was as much as we could afford at this time in a large-scale project. And just by comparison, you know, we're now sequencing recurrently 200,000 exons, 100,000-fold more from each sample, and moving now more and more to the study of whole genomes. In this systematic uh, kinase sequencing project, uh, we identified EGFR mutants. And we were actually fortunate here to have a collaboration with a thoracic surgeon from Nagoya, uh, Hidefumi Nag Nag uh, Sasaki, uh, who was a former postdoctoral fellow at Dana-Farber. And we got 62 lung cancer samples and matched normal controls. And we sequenced the activation loops of the receptor tyrosine kinases from his samples. Uh, and in these samples, we have identified the first mutation in EGFR that we found. They were somatic L858R mutations uh, in the kinase domain of the epidermal growth factor receptor gene, or EGFR, all of them in non-smoking women with adenocarcinoma from Japan. And the first mutation that we found uh, is shown here in this red box. This is the location of L858. It's right near this conserved aspartic acid 855 that's responsible for the chelation of magnesium uh, and is conserved in all protein kinases. Uh, it's also analogous to the residue L597 in BRAF, where we had previously found mutations uh, in lung adenocarcinoma. And I should mention that in addition to our work, a collaboration with Bill Sellers, Passiani, Bruce Johnson, and Neil Lindemann and others, uh, there was also work from Tom Lynch and Daniel Haber and from William Powell and Harold Varmus, uh, making the same discovery. Strikingly, we found somatic EGFR mutations in about 50% of lung adenocarcinomas uh, from patients from East Asia, originally patients from Japan, but also now uh, from uh, Korea, from China, and from other East Asian countries. In contrast, only about 10% of cases from U.S. and European patients. Uh, why is there this difference? I think we still don't understand. Is it a genetic difference? Is it an environmental difference? Is it some of both? The mutations are clustered in four areas, all around the, nucle in the nucleotide binding site here. And shown here in the structure is erlotinib bound to the kinase domain of EGFR, uh, but ATP binds in the same site. The extracellular domain would be up here. And the C-terminal domain would be down here. Uh, mutations in lung cancers are concentrated in the kinase domain. In glioblastoma, in contrast, they're concentrated outside the kinase domain. We see mutations in the nucleotide binding loop, deletions, amino terminal to this alpha helix, insertions, carboxyl terminal to this alpha helix, and in the uh, activation loop, shown here. All of four of these mutation types, with the exception of the exon 20 insertion mutants, are associated with response to erlotinib, gefitinib, and newer agents such as efatinib. Strikingly, there was an, a very strong overlap of two lung cancer patient populations, those who showed the increased, increased response to gefitinib, as shown here. This is a patient prior to treatment with gefitinib, and after three months of gefitinib treatment, showing a complete resolution, at least for a time, of, of the lung cancer. And the patients were those with adenocarcinoma compared to squamous carcinoma, patients from Japan or all of East Asia, compared to patients of European and also African descent, women compared to men, non-smokers compared to smokers. So these are the patient populations who respond the best to uh, gefitinib or to erlotinib. Uh, and in addition, they are uh, the patients who have the most EGFR mutations. As I say, I don't think we understand the mechanisms uh, that cause this increased fraction of EGFR mutations. What are some of the implications of EGFR mutation for lung cancer-targeted therapy? So if we go back uh, and we look at gefitinib clinical trials, in fact, gefitinib is still not approved for use in the United States. Um, but the original trials had shown no statistically significant difference uh, between placebo-treated patients, shown in light blue here, uh, patients treated with the gefitinib, shown in red, uh, or in green at two different doses. This is progression-free survival in the vertical axis and progression-free survival time in the horizontal axis in a Kaplan-Meier curve, although you do notice a small fraction of patients with increased long-term uh, survival. In contrast, in the IPASS study, uh, led by Tony Mock from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, the uh, study investigators compared patients whose uh, non-small cell lung cancers were EGFR mutation positive in the left panel, 
or EGFR mutation negative in the right panel. You can see for the mutation positive cases that there's a significant benefit associated by, with treatment with gefitinib in black compared to treatment with carboplatin plus paclitaxel in gray. In contrast, uh, for EGFR mutation negative cancers, there was actually a significant benefit from conventional chemotherapy, shown here in gray, uh, compared to gefitinib treatment, shown in black. Um, and so we can summarize that those patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer benefit from gefitinib, while those with EGFR wild type lung cancer do not benefit. But in aggregate, as you can see, the benefit is short-lived. Similar studies have now been performed for erlotinib, uh, for afatinib, and for a variety of other uh, EGFR inhibitors. Uh, more broadly, a genomic analysis has now been shown to improve lung cancer survival. And this is work of the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium clinical trial uh, led by Mark Chris, uh, Bruce Johnson from Dana-Farber, uh, Paul Bonn, and others. Uh, and what you can see here in this trial of 733 patients, uh, if you compare patients with an oncogenic driver and genotype-directed therapy compared to those with an oncogenic driver and no genotype-directed therapy, there's a significant increase in median survival from 2.4 years to 3.5 years, arguing strongly for the use of genotyping now in the treatment of a non-small cell lung cancer. You notice that in all these cases, however, the survival was limited. This is related to the uh, acquisition of secondary resistance by mechanisms such as the EGFR T790M mutation, uh, and uh, we now see the initiation of drugs such as AZD9291 uh, based on work by Passiana and Nathaniel Gray from Dana-Farber uh, that have the potential of overcoming resistance uh, and treating cancers with the T790M mutation. So we've seen a lot of success for EGFR inhibitors uh, in lung cancer. Why have these inhibitors not uh, succeeded in glioblastoma? And I just 